So this all precedes Glasgow, where they're having COP26, the, co the Council of the Parties, in other words, the states. And uh, I don't think we can expect much from that. <coughs> Key players are missing, like the Pentagon and Putin and uh, Xi from China. U.S. military is the world's largest single carbon emitter, and they put out recently, along with the intelligence communities, uh, reports that said, you know, the climate crisis is the biggest security threat we face, and there are no Department of Defense officials in Biden's delegation. And in Putin, I don't know what his excuse is. He, he runs a weak economy. It's about the size of New York State. But it's a petrol state dependent on selling gas and oil. So he really doesn't want to make commitments. And until recently, I think for public relations reasons, he was a he was as much of a climate uh, denier as Trump. And then you got President uh, Xi in, in China, where they just uh, having they're having energy shortages. They just uh, said they're going to build, I think it was 43 more coal plants and they build them fast. And uh, <clears throat> they don't plan to get to zero or what they call net zero emissions, till 2060. And they, of course, are the world's largest emitter now. So right off the bat, uh, you go into there and you're missing some key players. Um, and as I mentioned, the UN came out with a production gap study, which showed that uh, the world plans to extract more coal, oil, and gas 120% more than uh, we should if we want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. So people are calling, you know, the Glasgow summit the last chance. You know, I heard that about Copenhagen in 2009 and Paris in uh, 2015. And they had more on their agenda in terms of what was expected. The expectations here are low. I just hope people don't get discouraged when not a whole lot comes out of this uh, summit. And we'll have to see what it is, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be a lot less than what we need. We really need a global Green New Deal. The U.S. as the world's, uh, which has emitted 25% of historical emissions, and that doesn't even count our emissions abroad, uh, which we are still, uh, you know, is still a big portion of the emissions we should account for because usually and are often in U.S.-based corporations uh, that own mines and factories and agribusiness farms and plantations, uh, they're emitting a lot of carbon by burning fossil fuels to produce goods that we import and use. And a lot of times people think, well, they're mostly in the global south exporting to the rich north. And they do export a lot. But most of that carbon emissions from their production is for their domestic markets, particularly China. It's 85 percent in China. So uh, we've got to work with those countries. That's why we need a global Green New Deal. The U.S owes a climate debt, but rather than looking at it as, you know, some obligation we got to pay off, we should see it as an investment in the habitability of the planet for Americans as well as everybody else in the world. So that's what ought to be on the agenda, but there is nothing in Build Back Better for uh, international uh, climate financing, for building clean electric, uh, clean uh, power systems across the world or for uh, reforesting all the areas in the tropical areas, the temperate areas, the boreal, northern areas, uh, which would draw a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, and for the mitigation of the climate damage going on right now from you know, fires and droughts and floods and heat that has become uh, so hot in some of the tropical countries that uh, it's unlivable and people are moving. So we got a climate refugee problem. All that needs to be paid for. And the U.S. ought to be in the lead as the world's richest country. And as I said, it's an investment in our future as well as everybody else's. So the eco-socialist Green New Deal on a global scale is what we got to keep working for.